Welcome back, everyone. I'm Jordan Giesegi, and this is The Limiting Factor. Today, we have a special guest, Mark Thompson, CEO of Tolga Resources. Tolga Resources specializes in high-end graphite-derived products, such as battery anode and graphene. I got to know Mark over the past few months through email while I was researching the Tolga video. This is the first chance I've had to speak with him, and I've been looking forward to it. And with that, I'd like to welcome Mark. You kind of touched on this a little bit before. Once you're invested in uh, manufacturing equipment, you're kind of stuck with that for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. There's actually a lot of things that you said that resonated with me. Uh, that was one of them. And then the other is uh, a lot of these companies that are making big promises about what they're going to do in five, six, seven years from now, some of them probably will succeed. Uh, it's kind of, you know, throwing something at the wall and saying what sticks. But a lot of them, the most difficult times are ahead of them. Uh, and, it, you know, getting something to work at a lab scale is one thing, but getting to work at, you know, millions of cells a day is absolutely another thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, this is one of the, I guess, the, the bigger issues with all these new technologies that get come up in the media all the time is this flow now of, I think that they must be reading the clicks on these articles, right? Because the media is now just hot for anything battery-ish. So it's become like a, a real social media thing. There's an entire subculture now, right? Yeah. Of, of battery tech, um, everything from YouTube videos like, like, mm -hmm. like yours, but uh, it's growing and growing. But the media grab this stuff and then the investors see it. And I mean, I've, I've literally got a pile of papers right here on my desk now that are dropped off by shareholders who are like, they read about something, they print it out and they bring it here and say, what about this? And what about that? You, you have to qualify every single new tech that they hit, they hear about. And a lot of them are a bit sneaky about maybe the way the things get published. I mean, it's easy if you're a uni or you're a company that's got a, a piece of tech that you, has got great promise and great numbers and, and a battery in a, in a lab level, you won't be found out about it being non-commercial for about five years plus, right? So, yeah, no, no, and also people don't look back. So they sort of forget and by then you've gone on to something else. So it's, it's pretty easy spamming stuff. It's very, very hard to make commercial products and, and uh, commercial products are um, often uh, more limited, you know? So, I mean, silicon's a classic, like silicon's capable of great energy density, but in reality, a lot of, the battery makers for car companies are not trying to jump from like 360 uh, up to, you know, 2000 uh, milliamp hours per, per gram type density, they energy density, they just want to go from 360 to 500 or 360 to 750. That's the reality. And that's, that's going to go for years because you, yeah, you've got to set up those factories for a long time. And uh, this is another thing about new tech people thinking, well, the new tech will come in and then you can't sell anything. If you make standard anodes like, Nah, man, it's growing. You need millions of tons of this stuff. <laughs> and these factories are already built. They go on for tens of years. Um, I've actually visited the very first lithium ion factory that was ever uh, went into commercial production just after the, the patent got acquired by um, Sony. And then Sony sold it to a consortium of Japanese companies that ended up building a, a little lithium ion line on the northwest coast of Scotland. It's near Thurso, Scotland. All right. <laughs> that's, it's not, that's obscure. It's not, I, it is, it's a very little known story. And, uh, but they, it's still there. Um, it's under, it's with a group called Am, AMT, AMT uh, out of uh, the UK. And they make uh, lithium ion batteries. There have been for over 30 years. Like it's one of the earliest ones. And uh, it's, it's, uh, and because Scotland must have offered tax incentives and stuff for it to get built there. And um, now it's a little bit isolated, shall we say, compared to the rest of the, commercial world but there's there's people there making batteries today on the northwest coast of scotland etc anyway the point is that that tech evolved from uh, cassette tapes it was a way of using the old sony's old cassette tape making machinery so when they went to cds they had all these cassette tape making um for those of you too young to know cassette tapes were this way we listened to music 30 years ago 40 years ago yeah, <laughs> I've seen people grappling with cassette tapes. My son has no idea. He's also, it's like, how, what do you do with it? You know, so, so uh, anyway, that it's plastic. It's plastic film. Very big sheets of it, covered with metallic uh, material, very thin layer, and then you trim it. 
and you roll it up into little packages. I.e., if you want to make a, a roll of a, you know, a battery, it was like, well, we can make them commercially on that stuff. It's the same equipment, pretty much. And uh, you have coding, and then you have a com calendaring, you have a compression process, you have drying, and you have this uh, final spooling. And uh, so that's where it sort of started. And since then, you haven't had a huge amount of changes in that other than scale. So right now, you're starting to see the new changes. Now, that's 30 years without a change. So the point is, this, this battery tech is like what you're using today is still going to be big in 20 or 30 years' time, frankly. And when the new technologies come in, they go on top of it. They don't replace it yeah. because the, the, the current material way of doing it is cheapest. And if you want your $20,000 electric vehicle, not a 40000 or a 30000 you want a $20,000 and below electric vehicle without subsidies, every little bit counts. And so, yeah, so we absolutely sleep well at night talking about new technologies because they're just going to pile more demand on top, more silicon that goes on top of just the graphite. Then you have solid state sometime in the future and that's going to go on top of the silicon, which is on top of the graphite. And it's just, it, it doesn't replace it. It's just a wedge that just keeps growing larger over time. And I think uh, that's not appreciated so much by, the, uh, by people that get excited about those media reports anyway. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll make a couple of comments on that and then we'll jump into the interview. It looks like we have about a half hour of your time left. I don't know if uh, you have a meeting directly after this or not. Uh, I think but I'm, I'm open and I'd rather talk to you anyway if I can. So let me see. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I'm great. good. I'm, I'm good. So don't worry about that. I'm not worried if you're not. If you're, okay. if you're happy to cut stuff down, you let me know. But. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, the two thoughts I have on that is that. Uh, I need to do a video on startups because people don't understand what's happening with these startups. A lot of companies, they'll do a research paper uh, that gets a lot of, attracts of a, lot of, a lot of attention and gets attention to those researchers, but that isn't necessarily commercially viable. And then it, it's five years down the road after they start their startup where they realize it's a dead end. Another thing is um, the reason why you don't see quantum leaps in technology and people really are in love with the idea of, the idea of a quantum leap in technology, but it usually doesn't happen because technologies evolve the same way that like organisms evolve. And that is they generally build on what came before them and then just make a slight improvement to it. What was the significance of the agreement with Mitsui and what are the next steps to, to building that relationship? Because to me, that seemed like one of the most or the most important agreement that you've signed so far in terms of guiding the, the future direction of the company and how things are going to be funded. Yeah, good point. Uh, look, at, it's, it's quite important as far as, yeah, they start representing someone that's done enough work with you and on the project that they want to get involved uh, for the project, not just like taking the material or sales and distribution. They want to look at the whole thing. And uh, that's part of the build of the project. So, yeah, they're not alone. Uh, there's others in the room with them that... Um, are going through a similar process, shall we say. But, um, yeah, they're a really good company. If, they've got a very long history of being at the beginning of some industries in some countries. Uh, if you actually go back to the 60s in Australia, when, the, when the, they were involved in steel, obviously, for a long time. And so when Australia did not have an iron ore industry and it started opening up, Mitsui were one of the key companies that came in and helped fund not only the project and took equity in the project, but they also uh, did deals with the steel mills. They got involved with sales distribution and setting up all the stuff to do with the, the processing and all the things they were good at downstream back in Japan. So uh, if you look back, and that's 70 years now, they have got exactly the same equity interest. Like they, they've just still been there as partners in that project for 70 years and ended up profitably profiting from it very well. So um, I think if you look at their investments in things like that steel supply chain, they're looking to do the same thing in the battery supply chain. Um, they have got customers that are brands that you know and love. Uh, they, um, they've got really good knowledge. They're one of the most knowledgeable groups we've ever spoken to that understand particularly the anode supply chain. Uh, so yeah, really uh, happy to be uh, working with them as, as potential partners on this. I mean, there's, we can't reveal more details and, you know, it's still a process um, that they're looking at, you know, various stages about what they want to do. 
but uh, we're really excited to work with them. And also it's important to realize that this, that's not just an offtake type agreement. This is about working to build the supply chain. So um, they're one of the major companies of their type in the world. They're in the Forbes top 200, I think, or, or bigger. And of course, Buffett recently invested in them and along with others. Uh, so yeah, there, there's a small posse of very good quality companies that are close to the highest quality battery makers in the world. There was some news that came out today. There's a ASX news release. Yeah. And that le actually leads into my next question, which I was going to ask anyways, which the expressions of interest for tall node C have far exceeded the capacity. Yeah. The original plans for the Vitangi project were 20,000 tons a year for 20 years. And my understanding is that's locked in and that's not something that can be changed now. However, with the NISCA, NISCA expansion, my understanding is that you're working from a blank slate, both in terms of volume and in terms of the timeline. Is it possible to do both a larger volume and an accelerated timeline for NISCA? Not to say whether you are going to do that or not, but is that one of the in the realm of possibility? Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, thanks for mentioning. Yeah, today we yeah, did publish this uh, announcement about an increase in the amount of uh, graphite we have to make anodes from in the project. Um, we have to run two parallel programs where the southern deposit has to keep going the way it is, which is the 19,000 tonnes, which is roughly 19 gigawatt hours of batteries, of, of anodes for 19 gig. Uh, so I'll just speak in gig, shall we, for, for that stuff, because it's easier. But um, so the 19 gig plan for production is um, sort of locked in and we have to follow through and just leave that the way it is for now. The expansion will come from the other deposits and we're probably only a few weeks away now from publishing something that will show the target that we've chosen and show all the workings behind backing that up. But there's really no technical reason why you can't keep scaling up again from there. So um, yeah, the, the, the short answer is yes, we can scale up to the largest customer's uh, demands, technically, but of course we have to do that in res the most responsible way to all the stakeholders and, uh, and the regulators, and so it's a, it's a timing process. You can't really accelerate that process much. Sweden's a, a very high quality jurisdiction for everything from the environment uh, to governance issues and so forth, and so there's just a process you have to go through, and uh, it's very appropriate to have the highest standards, which takes time compared to operating in uh, perhaps say some other jurisdictions. Now that the horse is kind of bolted with uh, anode and things are, it uh, seems like they're really moving at pace. Mm. Is there any chance that the graphene side of the business will ever become as large as the anode business? Uh, there's definitely a chance, yeah. I think okay. it's just a matter of time. Uh, well, it, yeah, not, not specially for batteries, but I think batteries will, will drag it along. But um, I would have thought recently that because graphene can go into almost everything in the world, right? there's, there's almost nothing you can't add this stuff to to get some sort of effect out of it, a positive effect. And yeah. so when it can go into plastic and concrete and coatings and everything else, you would think eventually, I'm sure, and I'm, I'm confident that eventually graphene volumes will exceed that, right? So, I mean, the paint industry alone consumes, I think, over 200 million tons of total product. That includes chemicals and everything. But there's, I think there's like 40 million tons of physical like minerals in that. So the, the world of industrial products is much larger in volume than batteries can ever be, right? It's just too diverse and it's too big. So eventually graphene is, is like oil, it's everywhere and it's, 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 it's bigger. So uh, yeah, we, we see it's a glorious union of both. And to be honest, I see graphite that way too. I mean, you get a, a, a chunk of graphite with all these layers and you split off some of the layers and, and you can get graphene. But there are, there's a continuum from down in single layer graphene where you get quantum effects and stuff all the way up to say, say a 100 or 200 layer, like an atom thick layer particle. Some people will not call that graphene, but it sure as heck is not a graphite particle that has been available for, to the world for the last 200 years. Like, it is a brand new type of particle. It's not technically graphene, but it's the world's most super thin and different form of graphite. So that's useful too, right? So what do we call that? There's, in reality, there's a, when, you, when you work with cons the, the companies who want to make stuff, they don't really care so much about that. They say, how does it work in my product? And you say, well, add 0.5%, see what it does. It's going to increase your conductivity. It's going to 
increase your strength in this way. It's going to increase your strength in that way. Um, it's, it could even improve your gloss levels. Like it could change the way your product looks, right? It could be all sorts of stuff. And they try it. It's great. How much does that cost? Oh, it's X. All right. Can you make it cost X? Yeah, okay, let's work on that. And, and, and off you go. It's a very, very reactive process. But if you just put a can of, of graphene out there of this spec and expect them to take that and be able to just make it work for them, it's not. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the shipwreck of the last ten years of graphene commercialization. Frankly, is that sort of thinking that, that you can just build it and force everyone to make it because it's so great in the lab, and that's not the, you know what we've learnt is that's not probably the best way to do it. Maybe it works for others, um, but for us, it works better if we work from the solution the company wants, and we don't get tied down on specs. What we do is you just make something that works for them at the price point they need, at a commercially deliverable volume that you can you know, make. And uh, that's, that's the real world behind the graphene commercialization. And uh, that's very achievable alongside the anode materials, that's for sure. Yeah, I suppose the difference between the two is uh, with the anode material, you already know what problem you're trying to solve and there's demand there. Whereas with the graphene products, you're, you don't have that first question answered yet. Uh, there's no demand pull there. So it makes sense to... Uh, bide your time and play your cards right and wait for wait for things to come to you yeah it's 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 just a bigger more complex world right so i've always said batteries are like rubik's cubes you just you change one thing and it affects something else and so they're very they're actually very complicated and and uh can be diabolical to develop new battery materials and uh and, and graphene's worse to be honest because it's like a wall of rubik's cubes you've, you've got every single customer will have a different Rubik's Cube with different colors and different shapes. And that, that's where they're at, right? They're working with materials that have been you know, around for 100 years or 50 years. And so you put something new in there and it, it just takes testing, that's all, which takes time. And um, the investment world isn't so great with time anymore, right? So long-term long investment these days is like five minutes for some people, sometimes seconds. So, uh, yeah, that, well, that's why these Japanese companies like Mitsui are so good because a lot of these companies have such a long sites uh, some of these companies that warren buffett um uh, invested in they're they're hundreds and hundreds of years old yes, but, and, yes. and uh, you also touched on something that i find interesting about tolga and it only just occurred to me now why i find the company interesting because you're dealing with such uh, a diverse set of scales you're you're um you know, you have a logistics network that's hundreds of kilometers wide, then you have your mind, but you go all the way down to the chemistry of the cell in quantum effects. So there's uh, mm. quite a broad array of things that you're dealing with. You have to kind of be, <laughs> you most certainly have to be some, a lifelong learner in order to uh, keep up with everything that's going on and uh, understand everything that's going on with a company like yeah, that. Yeah, I, 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 I apologize. We didn't have a lot of models to work from. <laughs> <laughs> There's not many fully vertically integrated things yeah. out there, not from the ground to the product, you know, and, and I, I yeah, I, that's, uh, I love that about what we do is because we, we actually are all about that. We are all about, if you want this, what would be the most fundamental way to do it? I mean, I think we're aligned with a lot of our customers that way, but you go back to first principles. It's like, well, if the ideal particle to make that is this, how would you, and if it's not on our ground, it could be somewhere else. It could be a different way of making it, but we, we are all about, we, we actually went out and searched for a graphite deposit that had battery size anode flakes in it, like without the milling, without, without the sort of processing that other companies do to make it cheaper. And we thought that would just be more efficient. And in the process, you got higher grades, which means you, you move less tons. And then we can actually see how that, that deposit, the, the chemistry of the graphite itself and the crystallinity affects the way the battery works. So the way your Tesla or your Volkswagen or your, any of your electric vehicles, literally your range or the, your day-to-day -day interaction with your car is partially involved. I'm not just talking about quantum stuff. It is influenced by where that piece of graphite came from. Now, that isn't necessarily true with copper or nickel or cobalt and stuff, right? So apart from ethical and other supply chain issues, I'm just talking about the physics of it is... If you melt copper down and make it 99.99999% pure, it pretty much is the same from anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter. But anodes are different. Anodes are touchy-feely things. Anodes, the shape of the particle matters and the internal 
crystallinity matters and the edges of things matter. Like everything about them matters. They are their own Rubik's Cube within another Rubik's Cube. So the, whether you get it from Africa or Sweden or from Australia or somewhere else, the part of the Earth's crust, what, how the carbon got consumed. Like was it made from bacteria or did it come from a gas or a liquid? Like where did it come from? Is it methane? Or is it from dead bacteria bodies, you know, that got fossilized two billion years ago, like ours did, you know? So literally, can you imagine the shape of, or even the species of bacteria that died in, a, in an ocean two billion years ago that fell to the bottom and was buried and formed the carbon, which then turned into graphite, can influence how far your Tesla will go, right? It's, it will affect energy density and things like that. That blows my mind. I love that, you know? And I, I, love, I, I love working... <laughs> in that area it's physically true and it's uh, it's measurable <laughs> in uh in in some things and uh yeah so we we're excited about what we do because we think we've sort of cracked the most fundamentally you know beneficial way for the world to make this stuff and uh while i respect what everyone else is doing with their tech and everything else i usually see one single thing that's a real problem and uh uh, is a killer problem somewhere. And I, I like what we do. We like to think that we've got, you know, the best mousetrap, I guess. And, uh, but yeah, the, the, uh, as a vertically integrated company, there are not many people that own that entire supply chain. And so it's hard for people to value you or understand you. The mining guys don't get the tech. The tech guys don't get the mining. And in between, there's processing engineers and involved as well. So then there's processing tech. And uh, yeah, we, sometimes we don't maybe keep everyone happy, but we try. <laughs> and, and this is something I've said on Twitter before, is the last time I saw a company that I felt like had uh, the full strategic, the whole chessboard stacked in the right direction, the last time I saw something like that and got this excited about a company was when I saw Tesla. Because, like, for instance, Tesla started with the tires, and they worked from the tires up with, with first principles to build their vehicle. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what you're saying with the anode material. You have to find the right deposit first. And after you have that right deposit, then you can build up from there. Um, and it just so happened that that deposit that you found occurs in northern Sweden, where there's uh, cheap electricity, uh, a well-developed mining industry. Um, great logistics. Yeah, great logistics. There's a road. Bitumen yeah. Road runs right through. It's the highest load rated road in Europe. Railways 20 kilometers away, literally goes in direct on the rail. You can go uh, train directly into the factories of your customers in Germany, for example. Yeah, that's, and that's not something I even realized until I looked at the map and saw there is a, actually a railway awesome, that goes. Yeah, the awesome tunnel. Yeah, people yeah. forget that Sweden's connected to, to Denmark via this bridge tunnel. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty cool looking thing because half of it's the bridge and half's the tunnel, right? So the ships, yeah. certain ships can go under the bridge, but other ships that are too tall, so they, they, made, they float over the top of it coming out of the Baltic. But um, it's another one of the aspects of this project that we love. When you stack up all these things, you end up with, that's why our production costs can be competitive with China, for example, and uh, you stack all this up. And landed in a customer's uh, facility, even if we ship somewhere in the European region, um, is is still cheaper. I mean, especially if you do life life uh, assessment of your emissions, because now you've got a shorter transport network. You're using less diesel or you know bunker fuel and ships and all that stuff. And so again, we've got electric trains, and that's downhill from the site to the coast. So it actually can put energy into the grid going downhill because it's loaded, and on the way back up, the trains are empty. So they're using the power back again. So they're, they're basically CO2 neutral, even though the electricity is coming from hydro and wind anyway. So, you know, it's, it's crazy good. And that's why we think overall it's worth uh, doing. Nice. Uh, but, but yeah, the, the fundamental principles are, yeah, they're there. And uh, so we, we, we think that's why the, the project is, um, you know, it's, got, it's just got so much going for it. It's a project of its age, really. And uh, we're really uh, privileged to be able to work on, on this with so many cool people. And in the company, we've got lots of, uh, you know, it's the sort of company that uh, Telga employees are, are pretty excited, like about what we do. They're all excited about something. <laughs> They're yeah. all pretty passionate, excited about what we're doing um, because they get it. Yeah. Well, that's clear to me when I see the improvements that are being made. Clearly there's a whole organ organization that's devoted to this because it's, uh, you're improving the yield rates, et cetera. And yeah. 
yeah, it's clear there's people who are interested in making this a better product and who are vested in making the company succeed. And yeah. on that note, let's get into Telnode SI because that's actually what originally triggered this discussion. And that's the thumbnail that's going to go on it is the Telnode SI because I think people will be curious about that. So I don't know how much information you can give, but what triggered it for me was in my Shirley Mung interview two weeks ago, there was two key takeaways. One, that 20 to 30% silicon anode is the most likely next step for the development of the anode. She also mentioned silicon mesoparticles, which, and she was talking about uh, particles that operated at a, at a range of sizes at simultaneously. And I started looking into it and the particles that I found in research papers were actually larger particles that were made up of many smaller particles. And I saw that image and I saw the image of a tal node SI, which is essentially a perfectly spherical large particle that's made up of smaller particles. And it, it got me to wondering if that's what you're targeting uh, with tal node SI. Is, 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 is that in the ballpark of what you're targeting? Uh, I, I, I think uh, what you just said is, you know, largely correct. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's not a secret. We've published, I mean, yeah, you've got that photo. You can see you've got a, a ball that's made of different particles. So there's a composite of things going. And so, yeah, it basically qualifies as the particle of which you speak and of which you spoke with Shirley about. However, I will point out there's very different ways of the insides of those being built. So um, I noticed there was some speculation about things with voids and different sort of things that go in and out. And there's various technical papers over time. I think people in the industry look at those particles and they can sort of know something about the machinery, about how they were built, like put together. But then, but then the bits inside and how you do it is, can be radically different. And importantly, what Talgoth specializes in is making it in a really, really commercial way. So we focus a lot on cost. Um, frankly, for your friends at Tesla and lots of other car companies, man, they are absolutely brutal on cost. And, uh, uh, and when I say brutal, I mean, just, you know, it would blow your mind to know the, the, the details of how they operate. And certainly to me, when I was new to the automotive you know, industry and these uh, things, it, it took a long time to, to, to get over um, the way they sort of behave, frankly, <laughs> for what they want uh, and how they try to go about getting it. But, um, Anyway, so that aside, the point is, we know that costs have to be always, that they're, they're almost number one. Um, one day, uh, I can't tell that story either, sorry. Um, with, anyway, so the point is, we focus on, so the way those particles are built, what they're built from. So for example, okay, there's some silicon in there, right? You've got a choice, are things being made with silicon, uh, silicon or silicone and all these things. And the way people make silicon, a lot of silicon uh, today uh, come from silane or they come from, which is a chemical, or they come from, which is, it's not that cheaper chemical, um, and, or their gas vapor deposition, you know, and to us, they're, they're both pretty expensive. So we've come up with a, a much cheaper way to do it. We don't use gas. Uh, we use, uh, you know, chemo mechanical, should we say, processes. We do bulk industrial stuff. So we're practical people. I know we, we just came out of a whole geek fest on you know, sort of the philosophy of things. But in reality, we also are a bunch of engineers and people that build smelters and recycling plants and stuff. So they, we, we always do, we, we know it's got to be, there's a cost interface with the customer. And so our tech is always based on how does it use less energy? How can we buy the stuff cheaper if we need to buy anything at all, if we can't make it ourselves? How do we process that in the most uh, sustainable but lowest cost way as well always and so that's actually probably a big difference with us and that silicon particle that we make like is um, for a start as also I was really glad to see you and Shirley discuss that whole thing on the bang for the buck you get for silicon is the early part of the curve right so you can make 100% silicon stuff if you want and and try and and it's problematic, obviously. I mean, Jeff Dunn himself, I think, has come out and said, you know, a lot of really high silicon loadings are still 10 years sort of plus away. But you may never need them. Like, you, you, the first, the biggest kick you get is in that first 20 or 30%. So we make a particle, which, again, I think it's public from looking at our stuff. Maybe I shouldn't say. I think there's a presentation with some. Anyway, so you can imagine that our, we can choose what it is. And you could imagine that we would like a number, say, somewhere in the region of 20 to 30% silicon. And now you've got an anode that gives you the bulk of the bang for your buck. 
But now you've got to make it cheap. And those car makers want it cheap. They want to add the same price as like synthetic graphite anode is today. Right? So, and, and the, the, the guys that are doing gas vapor deposits and stuff, they may be five to 10 times that price. So we make something that is capable of getting down to those prices. Now you want to ride the most profitable margins on the way down, but yeah, that's, that's what we offer is it, when you see our performance numbers on some of the stuff we, and we obviously don't show more than we have to at different times for, for things. And, uh, but what you should realize is we are making the, the thing that ends up commercial and is a commercial price and, and gives most of the bang for buck. It won't be perfect. It's not the hundred percent stuff. It's something that is doable now, you know, can be in qualification processes now and be available really soon and be good margins for us, but very useful price for the, for the car companies, for example. So, I yeah. mean, that's, so when you look at our silicon, I don't want people to think, oh man, their silicon isn't as good as someone else's or whatever. It doesn't work like that. None of these battery materials work like that. It's, it's energy sort of divided by cost, right? And volume. It's, there's no point making something that you can only make, you know, five tons a day when the market needs, you know, a hundred tons a day, a thousand tons a day and your price level based on your energy and your inputs and stuff makes the price double what they want to pay. So uh, we, we make the practical put into production stuff. Yeah, you're going for the meat of the market, whereas a lot of these other companies, they, they may be focused on things that sound flashed, like 100% silicon anode, but what does that really do for people, and will you ever actually see it in a product? Probably not. So, Pro Probably, and if you do, you know. great, good on you, and yeah. uh, it's very worthy for people to try and do that, and what you learn along the way may be that, well, maybe that doesn't work, but you need 30% graphene in there, and now you've got a 70% silicon product, and that, that works really well. I mean, it, it just depends. But you've got to commercialize that before the next thing kicks in too, right? So right now, you've got increasing amounts of silicon, but the, it, again, as I said earlier, it doesn't take away the graphite anode because the overall volume growth is so big, the graphite keeps growing, then the silicon adds on top of that. But if you really want to go for a hard silicon tech, like something that's very difficult to do, eventually then you may get, uh, eventually you're going to overlap with the start of maybe some of the more commercial forms of solid state. And solid state, true solid state, very difficult still, still a long way away, further away than, than full silicon. But you know, we also work on a solid state product, which is designed to make it more commercial, where we we sort of decrease the amount of lithium metal, should we say, on the anode, and we, we change, we, we, we make that more commercially doable right? in all sorts of ways, not just cost, but safety of manufacture, uh, you know, you don't have to do it in a certain gas atmosphere, things like that. So th that technology will start coming in and, and impacting on you if you go for the moonshot. And while you're still working on it 10 years from now, and something else has come in. So yeah, we like working on the most commercial version of stuff. And it's usually a deliverable, executable, economic way of, of doing it, uh, but still being exposed to the better sort of margins and increased growth. And, and I think that's what nano companies should do, right? You should, why, why wouldn't you have a range of products? I mean, chemical companies have got a range of products and we do too. Absolutely. Pragmatic approach, bulk materials that go into go into lots of things. Uh, now, my understanding is that uh, Talnode SI is actually going through the qualification process with at least one company. I don't know if you can give any indication of how long it's been going through that qualification process, or if it's more than one company, or if you're seeing increasing interest in it. If you can touch on any of those points, it would be um, uh, yeah, sure. No worries. I'll, I'll try. Uh, it's um, yes. I think we came out maybe about a year and a half ago and said that it was starting to go to customers for testing. That was more early stage testing, what you'd call a sample for car companies. Um, since then, it has gone on a bit further with some. And yes, there is more than one. Yes, we're seeing increased demand, uh, quite strong demand. And yeah, I'm really pleased with where it's at. And uh, there's a lot of internal discussion and, you know, dare I say it, studies into what are we going to do about that? Like scale up from our current uh, volumes of samples. You know, there is definitely commercial pressure to have uh, more delivered and um, 
yeah, we're just excited about it. And also I should say I'm excited to work with battery companies at the moment that um, share our view on commerciality and um, what did you say, pragmatism? Yes. Uh, yeah, pragmatic view as to the next steps in energy density. Um, in fact, they feel a bit squeezed, to be honest, by the car companies about unrealistic demands or very difficult to deliver on demands and stuff. So they're, they're fairly pragmatic about getting it right, long-term safety, you know, life cycle, recyclability. You know, it's just great to interact with them. And Silicon, um, yeah, so Townode SI is being um, tested by more and more uh, companies and we have to look at how to address that demand uh, in the short term. That was, that was really good to hear from my perspective because when I first saw that you had the Townode SI product, uh, I was thinking that, okay, this is just kind of a future bet. I didn't really realize that people were actually testing it and there was significant interest in it. So I, I'm really excited as an investor now to see how this plays out. <laughs> After I put up my video, I invested. So I do have some general questions from... I should, I should be more careful than in any preambles. <laughs> now we're always careful. We're always good boys. That's why we, we don't maybe market as hard as some others. You know, we're just too, uh, we're too goody two shoes about that stuff. Well, we'll get into that a little bit because that's kind of one of the, the final general closing questions that I have. Uh, there's a lot of people asking about a U.S. listing for Tolga. What's the cost benefit equation of that look like? And is this something that's been considered? Uh, well, look, the classic answer is that we're always reviewing our opportunities um, for doesn't matter whether it's financing or listings and things like that. So we pretty much have been doing an annual review of that stuff for, for years now since we had European assets. You know, we often looked at going to London, for example, uh, or dual listing there. Um, yeah, we're really heartened by the interest out of America now and certainly the valuations we're seeing for battery startups. You know, I think we you know, obviously, what, QuantumScape, the, the media's got them at three, over three billion valuation on a solid state tech. Um, privately, we've seen Sila, uh, Sila Silicon uh, Tech uh, doing private valuations. They've talked about it themselves at being a billion dollar valuation. I think Daimler invested last time. So. Well, we've got a solid state product and uh, we've, we've got a silicon product and they're just buried in a company that's only valued at 150 million Aussie right now. So yeah, we see a lot of value to be... Uh, to be looking at, I think I think seeing those valuations and where the world's at does make us think a little bit about um, next steps. So we currently do trade in America anyway over the counter. What's called the pink sheets. Um, it's nothing to do with us. Someone just did it. Some market maker just lists you and off it goes. We are going to review if we can make that process a little bit uh, simpler and more and easier for American investors. We're going to look at that. Um, we also trade in Germany. We trade in actually. Uh, not just Frankfurt, Berlin, Stuttgart. There's all these little exchanges we're all listed on as well. So we get some European trading through those. Um, we will review our opportunities for the assets in the company uh, for things like valuations that maybe arise from, you know, spinning off a technology or spinning off a product could be uh, something that would be worth looking at in light of those sorts of valuations. We definitely don't, you know, we are not getting paid full value for what we have in the company at the moment, that's for sure. We're still very much under the radar and maybe, you know, I just haven't done a good enough job um, getting, you know, enough information out. We've been pretty busy building lots of stuff, uh, it would be my argument, but uh, I think from seeing these sorts of valuations on battery tech, I think it's a exciting space because a software type tech, you know, people are always excited about and they seem to be shifting towards, there seems to be a shift towards harder assets this year, like post COVID. There's a lot of movement towards gold. There's a big movement back towards resources. All the labs are full of samples and stuff like you, you have to compete with people to get samples through labs now because the, all this activity is flooded back into minerals and resources. And so I think, uh, um, I think battery tech is an interesting bridge, you know, it's sort of futuristic, at the same time, it's executable with this mega trend of EVs and the shift to more sustainable energy. And it's not just EVs, of course. We haven't talked about microgrid batteries. You know, we haven't talked about aerospace batteries. We haven't talked about VTOL. We haven't talked about, you know, literally flying cars. We haven't, we haven't talked about the way electronics are changing as well. We haven't talked about all these other aspects which all use batteries or some sort of energy storage. And... Um, so that seems to be where investors want some exposure to, like, and uh, Telga's very under the radar, I think, um, 
um, globally. And uh, so, yeah, it's, I guess, so no specific plans for a US listing, um, something that we'll review in light of what's been going on lately with, with valuations. And um, so I can't really say more than that yet until we finish taking a look at that. And of course, it'll very much depend on our project partners that over the next, I can't say when, but you know, short term, uh, when, as, as we sort of finalize how we finance and build the project, you know, that this could be a part of that mix. That's probably a good place to leave it. You actually covered the last three questions I had all in one fell swoop. Oh, so see, always ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so proactive. I, I think that pretty well covers everything because I, I, I too noticed that there's uh, companies out there that have massive valuations and you look at it and you go, why does this have such a value, massive valuation? Why is it garnered so much interest, even though they're talking about delivering something seven years away, whereas you have a company like yours with multiple uh, products and some of them which are coming to market in a big way within the next few years. So it, it did get me to thinking if you'd uh, been looking at how the company is marketed and structured. So it does sound like those gears are turning. I, I, we are in what, what we joke inside the company. We're in violent agreement. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Well, we'll, we'll leave it at that. And I, I thank you for your time. Pleasure, Jordan. Great catching up with you. Yeah. Jane. Cheers. Thanks. <laughs>